In this video, I'm going to talk about the normalization condition and how we can actually apply that normalization condition to the wave function. This video is part of a playlist on quantum mechanics. You can find the link to the playlist in the description below. In the previous videos, we mentioned the wave function and how it needs to satisfy the normalization condition. Now we're actually going to uh, find a procedure that's going to give us a normalized wave function. And once the wave function is normalized, it can be turned into a probability density function. And through the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics, we can use the probability density function to give us actual predictions about the probabilities of outcomes. So these are experimental outcomes. And that's the goal of quantum mechanics. So let's start off with the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation uh, has got some interesting uh, behavior that we're going to discuss. On the left-hand side of the equation, we've got some constants out over here. Then we have a partial derivative with respect to time of the wave function psi. And on the right-hand side, we have some interesting terms. This term over here corresponds to the kinetic energy. And it's got some constants out the front. And it's also got a second-order partial derivative with respect to the position coordinate. So this is, is talking about the kinetic energy. And psi appears over here again. That's the wave function. Then we have one more final term, and this is the potential energy term. V is the potential energy function. So if we look at this equation over here, and if we find a solution, psi, then we can actually use that solution uh, to make some meaningful predictions. But how are we going to apply the normalization condition? Let's say we solve the Schrodinger equation. We find ourselves some function that satisfies the Schrodinger equation. Right? Solving this is a whole another process. Right? That, there's another a few videos in this playlist dedicated to solving this guy. And it depends on what v is, because we're going to need different techniques uh, if we have different potentials. So let's just say we've gone through all that trouble, and we've actually found ourselves a solution. This function, f of x and t, if you put it in place of psi, it's going to satisfy this equation. So it's going to be equal on both sides. If we take this function, we can actually define our proper wave function, our normalized wave function, psi of x and t. We can define it to be some constant times f of x and t. And it's actually safe to say that if this guy satisfies the Schrodinger equation, this guy also has to satisfy the Schrodinger equation. Now, why is that the case? Well, if you were to substitute this guy into the left-hand side and into the right-hand side, both sides would be equal. Uh, let's, let's take a closer look and see why. If we put this into the left-hand side, this constant is going to get ignored by the time derivative. The time derivative doesn't care about this constant. So we can factor it out. On the right-hand side, this kinetic energy term is not going to care about the constant either, right? because these partial derivatives are with respect to position. And this constant does not depend on position. So we can factor that a out the front over here. And if we put psi over here as a times f, we can just move that a over here. So we can factor out an a out of each of these terms. So we can factor out uh, an a on both the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, and we can cancel it. And because we know f of x and t uh, satisfies the Schrodinger equation, then any uh, multiple of f of x and t has to satisfy it as well. This can be a complex number. It can be an imaginary number. It can have an imaginary component, a real component. It can be any mix. But we're going to run into problems if a is equal to 0. Because if a is equal to 0, then we have the trivial solution. That means the wave function is 0 over the entire domain. And if the wave function is 0 over the entire domain, the probability density function is also 0 over the entire domain. That would physically correspond to a probability of 0 for getting any outcome for your experiment. And that doesn't make any physical sense. That's why the trivial solution, where a is equal to 0, is unphysical. Right? It's an unphysical solution. So we can ignore that situation. So let's see what a has to be in order for the normalization condition to be satisfied. What value does this guy have to actually equal? So first of all, let's write down the normalization condition. So the normalization condition 
involves an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the square amplitude of psi of x and t. And we need this integral with respect to x to equal 1. And this is going to guarantee normalization. So this is what normalization actually means. We're, we're normalizing it to unity. We're normalizing it to the area under the curve, under that probability density curve, has to equal 1. So there's a probability of 1 for getting an outcome. right? It's certain that your experiment is going to give you an outcome. We just don't know what that outcome is, but we do know probabilities of certain outcomes. So if instead of psi of x and t, if instead we put a times f of x and t, what is that going to give us? Well, I'll write this out over here. We're going to have the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the absolute value of a times f of x and t. And this is going to be with respect to dx. So this is what we have. And this has to equal 1. Now, what can we do to this expression? Well, we can actually take this constant out of the front. And it's going to be a squared constant. And we're going to have to take its magnitude. Because remember, this can be a complex number. So what we're going to get is we're going to get an absolute value of a squared. Right? That's what this is. Absolute value of a squared out the front. And that's going to be multiplied by the square integral of our solution function f of x and t. So that's this guy over here. So what we've done is we've moved this constant from the inside to the outside. So we just have to take the absolute value and we have to square it. So as long as this is equal to 1, we have a normalization condition. So if we're given this function, what we have to do is take its square magnitude, integrate it over the entire domain, and that's going to give us a value whose inverse is equal to the square of a, or the square of the magnitude of a. So how do we find this constant out the front? How do we find a? Well, we have to do this integral. And then we have to find the value of a, which is going to guarantee this integral equals uh, to 1 when you multiply it by that value of a. So this is how we find the normalization constant. This process over here is what you have to do. If you find a solution to the Schrodinger equation, all you have to do is take the square integral over the entire domain, and then that, uh, through some simple algebraic manipulation, is going to give you this constant. So this constant tends to have square roots in it, right? Because what we're dealing with is a squared over here, or the magnitude of a squared. So if this gives you some nice simple expression, this expression, or 1 over this expression, and then square rooted, is going to give you the constant a. And we, we're actually going to be using this process in later videos. This is the process that's going to allow us to apply the normalization condition, and then that's going to give us a meaningful wave function that actually has a physical interpretation when we turn it into a probability density function. So that's it for this video. You can find the other videos in this playlist if you click over here.